Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Penn State College of Medicine COVID-19 Echo Series. We're delighted to have you join us for another session. My name is Jackie Sable. I'm a member of the ECHO team and I'll be facilitating today's session. A few announcements before we begin. If you've not already done so, please put your name, email address, and affiliation in the chat box. Please stay muted unless you're speaking. On a phone, you can use star six to mute and unmute, or you can use the microphone icon on the bottom left-hand corner of your laptop or computer. We may, you may also use the chat for communicating. We will be monitoring it throughout the session. We realize that question and answer time is important to you and we're trying to categorize and address as many questions as possible here, but we'll follow up with any open items after the session. If you have suggestions for future COVID-19 echo topics, please share via the chat tool, <clears throat> or you can email us at echo at psu.edu. <clears throat> please remember that no personally identifiable information is allowed we are recording these sessions and we'll share all materials and the recordings after the session. In the spirit of all teach, all learn, we'll be on a first name basis during the sessions. For those of you who are new to Project ECHO, our ECHO sessions always begin with a brief lecture followed by a case discussion. Cases could include a cha challenge or a question that you would want to address. They're a critical component of the ECHO model and we encourage you to submit cases which can be related to patient's preparedness policy or any challenge where you would like to generate discussion. The link to submit cases is always included in our follow-up emails. Our session today will include a lecture by Dr. Jamie Polly on COVID-19 during pregnancy, followed by case discussions. During the lecture, please feel free to put your questions into the chat. We have a team of specialists from Penn State and they will help to field questions as they are able. But remember that this is all teach, all learn, so everyone can submit both questions and answers. We will pause briefly between the lecture and the case to address any questions. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Jamie for our lecture. Okay, I'm unmuted, so hopefully everybody can hear me. I'm Jamie Pauli. I'm one of the maternal fetal medicine attendings here at Hershey. And um, I'm also the medical director of labor and delivery here at Hershey. And I was asked to give a talk about COVID-19 during pregnancy. Little disclaimer, every single day we get new data. And I made this lecture on Friday and then was on call this weekend. So I, some of this may be even, it's rapidly changing, um, but I tried to summarize what we do know so far. Can you hear me? Okay. Jackie, it says I'm muted. You muted me. You're fine. You're you good. You can hear me? Oh, okay. My computer keeps telling me I'm muted. Sorry. No, you're fine. Okay. Um, so I wanted to have everybody become familiar with some of the most current data available regarding COVID-19 and pregnancy, and then be able to demonstrate an understanding of some of the recommendations for changes in antepartum, intrapartum, and postpartum care in response to the pandemic. And then I have a couple of cases that um, kind of help us work through some of these concepts um, of patients that we've cared for here so far in the pandemic. So what do we know about COVID-19 and pregnancy? What we do know about women who are pregnant, we know they're more susceptible to some of the other respiratory viruses. So we learned a lot from the SARS which is also a coronavirus, the MERS outbreak, which was also a coronavirus, influenza, those of us who lived through H1N1 with our pregnant women, these women were at much higher risk of hospitalization, ventilation, both maternal and neonatal death, and preterm birth. So the presumption when COVID-19 came around that we were very concerned that there were going to be significant complications for our women um, who were pregnant because of the known susceptibility to respiratory viruses. Also, there was a concern about whether or not the, the virus is vertically transmitted. So that's kind of when this all started where we all were very concerned. Some of the first data that came out of China was with Chen et al. in the Lancet article this year. They presented nine patients. Seven of them presented with fever. All of them in this, in this case series 
had um, cesarean sections in the third trimester. They did note that for women who were pregnant, they had similar symptoms to the non-pregnant patients. None of their patients actually fell into the severe category. None of them died. And there was no evidence of vertical transmission. They did um, actually do a lot of swabbing. They swabbed the amniotic fluid, cord blood, breast milk. They swabbed all of the neonates. Everything was negative. So at this point, they didn't think they saw a lot in terms of vertical transmission in this small case series. Four out of nine of them um, had preterm births, but it's important to note that actually only one of them was a spontaneous preterm rupture of membranes. Everybody else was delivered for things like preeclampsia or non-reassuring fetal heart tones, or they did deliver some of the patients just because they had COVID and they were concerned. In March of this year, Lee et al. put out a case control study, which was a very interesting study. They had 16 lab confirmed COVID-19 cases, and then they had 18 patients they included in their cases of suspected. And this was based on, they actually ran every one of their third trimester patients in this case series through the CAT scanner. And these patients that were suspected but negative had very classic findings of COVID on CT scan. Then they looked at two sets of controls, a historical control from 2019 and then another control from 2020 of pregnant women without pneumonia. So it was a little bit of an interestingly constructed study. All these patients were third trimester from 33 weeks to 40 weeks. Every patient had a CAT scan. In general, they reported these patients had mild respiratory symptoms. They, the main things were fever and pneumonia. None of them had any critical illness. One of the things that was incredibly interesting, and it comes up with some of the later data, is that very few patients actually had symptoms on admission. And that's one of the things that is most concerning about um, the pregnant patient population is that they're frequently asymptomatic and then develop symptoms. So in this case series, some patients developed symptoms and were subsequently tested. And then many places eventually moved to universal testing and then they picked them up on universal testing. They did a lot of C-sections in this um, case series, and it was approximately more than double their controls. So if you look in the, in the confirmed group, 87, almost 88% had a cesarean and 89% in the suspected cases. That's compared to 47% in 2020 for the controls and 36% um, in 2019. Um, in terms of preterm birth, again, higher rate of preterm birth, 23% of the of the confirmed cases, 21 of the suspected, compared to their historical, con their controls of 5.8 and 5%. They did also have an increased risk of low birth weight, although that can also be attributed to the increase in the preterm birth rate, um, which was higher than in their controls. They did not document vertical transmission in this case series either. More data, Lou et al, another group, this was 13 patients, only two of whom were second trimester, less than 28 weeks. Um, they were all positives. Um, three patients were actually admitted and then discharged undelivered, they recover. 10 of them underwent cesarean sections, five of which were emergent. They had six preterm labors and one stillbirth. And in this case series, they did have one mom who was on ECMO. So one, you know, eventually a patient who was quite ill who required um, significant critical care. I included this case report from Wang et al. That was um, the case, one, one of the first cases of possible um, vertical transmission. This was a mom who was 40 weeks gestation. She presented with fever, vaginal spotting, and abdominal pain. She had a CT scan that was um, consistent with a viral pneumonia and eventually was tested and was COVID positive. They did a cesarean on her. The baby um, had meconium but was otherwise uh, very healthy. They put that baby immediately in isolation, separated it from the mother. They did not allow her to breastfeed. 36 hours after birth, that baby swab was positive for COVID-19. And interestingly, they swabbed the placenta, the breast milk, cord blood, again, all negative. Um, but the baby who did very well, had like three CAT scans during its, during its hospitalization, and did have some CT findings that were somewhat suspicious for pneumonia, but not as clear cut as some of the adult CAT scans. Eventually, both mom and baby did just fine. So this was one of the cases, and there's a smattering of them in the literature of possible vertical transmission. It's never 
as 100% as clear because there's still concern in these hospitals, what could this have been a nosocomial infection, um, even if they separate the baby from the mom. So not 100% clear, but purported to be a vertical transmission. And then in March, um, Breslin et al, who, came, who are from um, New York Presbyterian, so the epicenter of the outbreak in the United States, published a case series of some of the early lessons that they learned in obstetrical patients and COVID-19. They had seven cases um, in, the one, in their one hospital. Five out of seven of them were, not, were afebrile upon admission, and four out of the seven did not at first report cough, but may have um, done that afterwards. They admitted four of them. Two of these patients actually ultimately required ICU admission. This is such an interesting paper because both of these patients presented for induction of labor, completely asymptomatic. They didn't come because of COVID. They came to the hospital because they had some type of medical complication of pregnancy, hypertension, I think was, um, and diabetes maybe for the other one, and subsequently developed COVID. First patient, again, afebrile upon admission. She was just there for induction. She developed a fever during labor. And as obstetricians, you know, the presumption is this is chorioaminitis. They gave her antibiotics. Eventually, she needed a cesarean for um, a, her failed induction and had a um, pretty significant hemorrhage required. She was unstable, so they intubated her. Within one minute of her intubation, the patient had respiratory distress and bronchospasm, and it ended up being admitted to the ICU for her respiratory distress after they had controlled her hemorrhage. Her cesarean otherwise was fine. They got the hemorrhage under control and she was extubated eight hours later in the ICU. She did well, but one of the lessons they learned from this particular case, because she subsequently tested positive for COVID, was that there were 15 healthcare providers involved in her care. She was a long labor, she had a cesarean, she got transferred to an ICU. All of those patient providers were exposed without PPE during her labor and delivery. The second case had um, a, a C-section for failure to progress and 25 hours after her cesarean developed a cough and respiratory distress. She ended up being admitted to the ICU actually because she became so severely hypertensive that she required, required a necardipine drip, which is interesting. There's a lot, there are a lot of um, case reports and sort of speculation in the, um, in the COVID literature about sort of atypical preeclampsia presentations for some of these patients. Um, she, in addition to requiring um, hypertensive therapy, she also had an oxygen requirement. She developed acute kidney injury and subsequently was diagnosed with COVID. So again, there were 15 to 20 healthcare providers who were exposed to her in her quote unquote asymptomatic or potentially pre-symptomatic period without PPE during her labor and delivery. She um, also did fine. And then just a few days, like with last week, the same group published um, two weeks worth of data cases in two New York City hospitals. Again, kind of trying, sort of looking at the presentation in pregnant women and also the asymptomatic carrier rate. In this, in this case series, seven of them were the patients from that first group, the seven before universal testing, but these hospitals instituted universal COVID testing for their obstetrical patients. So they had 43 women who were tested positive. Only three of them were initially admitted for COVID symptoms. 18 of them were admitted for obstetrical re reasons. So delivery, preterm labor, et cetera. 22 of them, so about 50% of them were actually tested positive and were able to be managed as outpatients. Again, and I think we're see it's, it's again, so interesting. The literature is really only reporting cases in the third trimester. Very rarely are we seeing things in the first or second trimester. So again, these patients were 32 to 38 weeks gestation. Um, some of this I'm sure is biased based on the fact that they are presenting to the hospital. So third trimester more likely to present to the hospital. What's very interesting and is reassuring, I think, that the disease, the disease severity in pregnant women is mimicking the disease severity in the general patient population. So again, going back to my very first slide, we were so worried in the very beginning that pregnant women were going to have much poorer courses as a result of COVID. 
but they appear to actually be doing as well as the general population. So 86% of them had mild symptoms only, 9% had severe, and then 4.7% had critical requiring um, ICU admission. And this is almost, these numbers almost exactly mimic the numbers that came from China, the ones that are coming now out of the United States in terms of how patients are uh, reacting to the disease. Um, interestingly, um, for the patients who were symptomatic at con presentation, 67% of them in this tiny group of 43 patients, 69% of those patients, so 20 patients, had a primary complaint of COVID symptoms. Most commonly, again, just like the rest of the patient population, dry cough, fever, myalgia. So again, COVID appears to be presenting the same way. 86% of these patients, though, were able to be discharged home for quarantine, for 14-day quarantine. So they were not ill enough to require hospitalization. Um, most of them did not need to be readmitted or, or delivered as a result of their COVID. 13.8% of them, four of them, it required admission for OB, admission, uh, OB reasons. So they were symptomatic, needed to be admitted for OB reasons. And then um, some of them needed to be, 13.8% of them, again, need to be admitted for worsening COVID symptoms. So they went home to quarantine but needed to come back. So they had increasing fevers, increased work of breathing. Interestingly enough, and they, they, it's, most of it was within a week of diagnosis that they needed to be readmitted. And they all, the, these four patients who were admitted for worsening COVID symptoms, they outline in this article how they treated them. And each one of them got something just a little bit different. Some got antibiotics only, some got antibiotics and hydroxychloroquine, some got just, one of them just got IV hydration, some got oxygen. It was, the, each of the four patients had sort of a tailored um, treatment, I think, as they're trying to figure out how to take care of these patients. There's not one standard treatment being purported for these patients either. For the patients who were asymptomatic upon presentation, so there are 14 patients, so 32, almost 33% of their group were admitted for obstetrical reasons, did not have any reason to think that they had COVID. The two patients that were admitted to the ICU are the ones from the original case report. And I think actually the one who was in the ICU for hypertensive crisis at the time of of the writing of the paper was still in the hospital, but doing better. Of the 12 remaining, four of them were completely afebrile and completely asymptomatic their entire hospitalization. Eight of them developed fevers during their hospitalization. Five of them were intrapartum, so again, presumed chorioamnionitis, they were given antibiotics. Three of them developed postpartum fevers. None of these patients um, require, had respiratory symptoms, and none of them had prolonged hospitalizations. The 12, or the 13 patients who were discharged, they're doing follow-up on them, and again, at the time of the writing of this paper, they had no emergency room or office visits needed specifically, but a significant percentage of them who were um, discharged still had symptoms. They developed symptoms uh, during their uh, home quarantine, so cough, myalgias, chest pain. Um, the inability to smell or taste is an interesting um, symptom. It's not the, the most common presenting symptom, but it's certainly being reported in both the general literature as well as the obstetric literature. As, and for some patients, it's the only symptom that they have. Um, one of our cases, the partner could not smell for two weeks, and that was how they ended up diagnosing him. Um, in terms of the deliveries, they delivered 18 of these patients. In the American studies, there are many fewer cesareans. Um, so they did eight C-sections, 10 were vaginal. All of the patients had neuraxial anesthesia, um, and one of them was um, converted to general anesthesia. That was the patient who had the hemorrhage. Um, 15 of their infants were negative. Um, they tested them for COVID uh, with swabs on day of life zero. A couple of them had an indeterminate test and were negative within the next couple of days. There was one infant, infant that continued to have an indeterminate test. They treated the baby as though it was a presumed um, positive in isolation, and all of them did really well. There were three NICU admits, and none of them, one, that one was a premature baby, one was a known congenital anomaly, and one was a sepsis rule out who did fine. 
So um, really no evidence of, of vertical transmission and the infants, again, these are third trimester babies, um, all did very well. So in terms of the review of the literature, and again, my caveat in the beginning is that every day we get more case reports, case series. We are not, these are not randomized clinical trials. The publishing that's happening is happening very quickly. The peer review process is being expedited, but every day we, there's a running list of all of the new case reports coming from all over the world. Um, but to the best of our knowledge and best of the information we have thus far, pregnant women do not appear to be specifically more susceptible to COVID-19 than the general patient population. Um, and on April 6th, uh, the American College of OBGYN and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine issued a joint statement um, stating this and saying that again, that the women who are pregnant who are, have COVID-19 are following the um, severity scale of the general population. So again, the vast majority of these patients have very mild disease and do well, very small amount with severe or critical illness. Um, and so the CDC, who had originally placed pregnant women on the list of patients who are at higher risk for severe illness, actually removed them from that. So that list now that is, has a specific, you know, immune compromised patients, patients over a certain age, et cetera, patients with heart disease, pregnant women are no longer on that list, um, which is, um, is in and of itself an interesting topic. The other thing that we learned from some of the more, re from, the, from what we're hearing from our colleagues in New York City is that universal screening is revealing a surprisingly high either asymptomatic or potentially pre-symptomatic positive test rate. And just the lessons that were learned from the two patients who were completely asymptomatic upon admission for an obstetrical reason were both ended up being, there were the two patients who went to the ICU, not the patients who presented with COVID symptoms. So that leads me to some um, changes in obstetrical care that have been um, suggested by both um, ACOG and Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. And I think this is happening across, you know, sort of globally in terms for medicine, but specifically obstetrical patients require um, a lot of in-person visits and a lot more kind of a a, a condensed amount of frequent visits, especially at the end of their pregnancy. So the implications for COVID, especially with social isolation, are how do we alter their care to protect both the patients and the providers, but also continue to provide prenatal care, which um, revs up at the end of the pregnancy. So there are a lot of suggestions about uh, from both SMFM and ACOG about spacing out um, pregnancy visits and um, type, um, triaging it based on the risk of the patient um, and their specific needs. There's a lot of information, a lot of places have started doing screening, both phone call screening, as well as in-person screening prior to the visit. So checking people's temperatures um, when they come to the clinic, asking their questions. Um, the incorporation of telemedicine has been, in Hershey, we, it has been a rapid change for us. We're in-person people. We see our patients, I think many, you know, as many patients do, but telemedicine is not traditionally something that we've used in obstetrics. And so converting the things that we think are appropriate for telemedicine, so consultations, um, blood pressure checks, incision checks, using our patient portals, um, and leveraging all of the different platforms. That has been a big, um, a big change, um, both for our nursing and our provider staff. There, um, in terms of ultrasounds and antepartum testing, every institution has a different sort of schedule that they follow. Um, and there are recommendations for triaging the importance of ultrasounds. So if you have a patient who requires a growth ultrasound on a monthly basis, does that patient potentially have the, we have the option of stretching her to six weeks between visits. Um, condensing the viability ultrasounds into the first prenatal visit, which some practices do automatically, but some do a viability scan before the patient sees a provider. Just kind of trying to think outside the box in terms of how can we limit the number of times a patient needs to be seen, but also make sure that she gets what she needs and what, and gets, you know, is 
is um, appropriately cared for based on her risk factor. Um, places who do antepartum testing with non-stress tests and biophysical profiles, there have been recommendations for um, decreasing the number of times a patient comes per week, depending on the um, condition. They may come two or three times a week and doing it down, taking it down to once a week. One um, interesting sort of thing that we had to think about very early on in our institution was what do we do for our patients who are pregnant, who require an in-person visit, do not need to go to the hospital, but need a clinic visit, and they are either COVID positive or awaiting a test. In the beginning of the pandemic, we were waiting weeks for tests. And so we had patients who were persons under investigation, that's what PUI is, for up to two weeks who still needed prenatal care. So we had to kind of flex a little bit and figure out how could we see these patients. We, in Hershey, we actually converted our lab into a negative pressure space that could be um, turned on and activated within a couple of hours. We put an ultrasound down there and um, made it so that if a patient required an ultrasound required testing needed to be seen that we could see them, but also do it in a safe environment for the providers. And then visitor restrictions um, came rapidly and changed rapidly. Um, we went from restricting the no number of visitors to no visitors in our outpatient clinics and no visitors um, in the hospital except for very special accommodations. Luckily, although it was a challenge in of, of itself for us, we were able to keep visitors for our labor and delivery patients, but it, it presents, it still presents a challenge because visitors are potential um, patients who, people who could have COVID and who need to be screened. And if they screen positive, then you have to have an, you have to have an intervention, how to care for them and to how you, in a um, compassionate way, have them not come for the labor and delivery of their child. So it was, it has been a very interesting um, kind of process as we've moved through all of this. And we do have some guidance, but every institution has their own version of it. And so every, you can, every day we have had to alter it a little bit. Um, this is a COGS um, outpatient and assessment for a woman who has suspected or confirmed COVID. And I just put this up here just as an example of um, one of the many types of algorithms that have been um, put out there. This was a joint ACOG and SMFM. So again, this is something we, we would use in terms of how do we take care of the patients and how do you screen them and get them to where they need to be. So based on their risks. For us, if they are screen negative, then they would be seen in our regular clinic. If they screen positive and they're stable and do not require an OB triage on labor and delivery, they'd be seen in our negative pressure room or in one of our uh, multidisciplinary COVID unit, um, clinics. But if they need to come to the hospital, then we have to make accommodations for them there um, as to how to see them. Here are some of the things that SMFM put out in terms of, how, again, this is some of the guidance and I just kind of cut and pasted it from this AJOG MFM article. All of the, it, one of the nicest things about COVID is that everybody is just putting everything for free up on all their websites. You can get this, these recommendations easily without being a member right now, which is awesome. Um, but here for this particular box here, it's talking about how many times do you need to see a patient? As an MFM, this is like almost nothing for me and my patients would have been seen probably twice as many times. But spacing out how many times a low risk patient needs to be seen and combining everything into one visit. So skipping the in-person nurse visit and doing it on the telephone and then at the first OB visit, doing the exam, doing the ultrasound. If the patient wants genetic screening, getting it done right then and there. So making sure that the ultrasound is at the time of the nuchal translucency, if that's what they want. 20 weeks doing the anatomy scans. And again, just kind of moving, moving through that process. Over here is one of SMFM's sets of recommendations for how many times you would wanna do um, ultrasounds on a patient who has these multiple medical complications and um, when you wanna do uh, antenatal testing. 
some of the recommendations over here are talking about real, we do twice weekly testing routinely. We've gone to once a week, except for patients with growth restriction and abnormal Dopplers. And again, in an attempt to limit the amount of time a patient needs to come to the clinic, the patient already needs an ultrasound rather than having her come for a non-stress test and then do the ultrasound, potentially converting that to a biophysical profile. We have changed our version of this multiple times at our institution in an attempt to, again, streamline it for the patients and to make sure that they're getting what they need. One of the biggest things I think that we've noticed are, is that we need to emphasize to our patients that we are still available to see them. If they have an acute need, our clinic is open. We're not trying to not see them. We're trying to keep them safe and keep them at home for as much as possible. Um, intrapartum. So um, we actually have had a change in this at our institution this week, but um, so many institutions are prioritizing rapid testing of pregnant women upon admission versus the universal versus symptomatic only. And the reason for that is, again, that um, obstetrical patients are, in general, you can only make them elective for so long. You ha they have to still deliver. This is not an elective surgical case that can be put off for eight weeks. Um, and so they, the volumes aren't changing for OB. Um, also, our patients have a lot of face-to-face -face time in labor and in delivery with the providers. So we actually just started our universal screening this week, and it's not perfect yet. We're still working on the process. Um, in terms of visitor restriction, some of the, I talk, we have no visitors in the outpatient clinic. Our patients who are coming for labor and delivery are, their visitors are being screened. Everyone is wearing a mask. And we are making accommodations for our patients to be able to stay with their partner the entire hospitalization and to not have them be wandering back and forth. So we're really just trying to change the culture of visitor restriction and trying to just keep the patient and the visitor together. And then PPE is a huge issue. One of the benefits of universal testing and of, for COVID is that we can preserve PPE and use it appropriately um, for our healthcare workers. So if a patient is COVID positive, then full P special precautions PPE is recommended for labor and delivery because of the potential for aerosolization during um, vaginal delivery, as well as C-sections. Um, but if we universally test, we can limit it to the patients that really need it. Um, something that I, I think is more, Lawrence mentioning, changes in obstetrical care. There are some statements both by ACOG and SMFM about corticosteroids. We use them, betamethasone or dexamethasone for fetal lung maturity um, in patients who we suspect are at risk of preterm birth within seven days. The experience with MERS and SARS, both of which were coronaviruses, were that corticosteroids, which are sometimes used for sepsis, may actually delay viral clearance and worsen disease course. So for patients who are not pregnant, who have COVID, they are not using steroids as part of their ICU care for the ones that are very, very sick. So then the question was, well, should we be using steroids for our COVID positive moms who potentially are in preterm labor? Um, and the recommendations that kind of came down were as follows. For the patients who we would traditionally offer less than 34 weeks, to strongly consider it unless the patient is critically ill, and then to really have a multidisciplinary discussion about the risks and benefits with infectious disease and the medicine teams about whether or not the potential risk, if you really don't, if you're not sure the patient's going to deliver, if that risk is worth it, um, we will still give them if we think that the patient needs them. The late preterm steroids, where the benefit to the fetus is not as well-defined, actually ACOG and SMFM are saying don't give it to the COVID-positive moms. It's probably not worth the risk. Um, and so we have stopped doing that for our COVID. We, we don't have a lot of COVID-positive moms, but we're not offering late preterm steroids per the ACOG recommendations. Um, we are certainly still offering them for the patients who are not COVID positive. And again, with universal testing, that's going to be a more of a definitive answer. Um, but it's just, it was an interesting thing that came up that um, we had, ACOG and SMFM really had to respond quickly to. In terms of breastfeeding, um, CDC absolutely recommends that breastfeeding is fine, but they do recommend that if you have a COVID positive mom, 
or a person under investigation mom that the mom and the baby are separated, which is of course a huge issue. We know that virus has not been found in the breast milk to date, but it's spread by respiratory droplets. And again, like anything else in obstetrics, there's a lot of face-to-face -face time with breastfeeding. Um, oops, sorry. Our patients are encouraged to perform great hand hygiene, wash the breasts, express milk, breast milk by a pump, and to be fed by, fed, have the baby fed by a well caregiver. And this is coming directly from the CDC. And again, all the parts of the breast pump should be washed and disinfected. If for whatever reason the mother declines to be separated from her baby or insists upon, wants to do um, breastfeeding at the breast, then hand hygiene and the mom wearing a mask for feeding is what is, what is recommended. We are currently separating our newborns from our COVID positive moms in our hospital, at least until they go home. In terms of postpartum, expedited discharge is what's being recommended, if at all possible, get our patients in and out. So we've been sending them home a lot sooner than we would normally. And this may be, and there are many places where this is the standard. It was not the standard at our institution. And so we really had to kind of make sure that when we are sending them home, we're giving them really good discharge instructions. We're coordinating with peds um, because not all babies are ready to go home day one after a vaginal delivery. Um, and then making sure that our patients understand that just because they're home, this, it's, this is a different time than it's not when everybody comes to visit the brand new baby in your house, the social distancing, limiting visitors, et cetera. We are converting a lot of our postpartum visits to telehealth visits. Um, we've started um, getting patients home blood pressure cuffs. We have a lot of hypertensive disorders at our institution. And so we typically see our patients at one week postpartum in, the, in person to check their blood pressure, to check their incisions, and to do depression screening. And we've converted that all to um, telehealth and sending patients home with a blood pressure cuff and instructions how to use it. Patient portals are really useful. Um, patients can actually upload photos of their incisions. If they have concerns about mastitis, we can see it securely in their chart in the patient portal and be able to, you know, to help them without having to, again, bring them to the clinic, potentially expose them. Um, Talking about contraception um, for these patients, uh, talking about long-acting reversible contraceptives is important if that's something that they're interested in because they may not be seen for a little bit. And then lactation support. We've been working, our lactation consultants um, are working both in person and telemedicine, but really, again, just making sure these patients are supported and they're getting the care that they need just in different ways than we've done before. All right. So that was like rapid fire, and I think I almost made it to my time frame. This is when I'm supposed to stop and offer to answer any questions about, like I said, that rapid fire presentation. So Jamie, are you able to see the chat? Um, I'm happy to read these off for those who cannot see. Um, Gloria. I can see the chat, hold on. Um, I see one question from Gloria that says, Glad to hear about universal testing. How long is the turnaround time for the test at your institution? So right now, the, the difference is we have an in, our in-house test. We can usually get it back within a couple of hours, um, which is great. We're looking at trying to do that in-house test the day before a scheduled delivery so that those results are available upon admission because it does delay care a little bit. So if you have a cesarean, a scheduled C-section, she comes in, we swab her and it takes two hours, we have to wait. They go into droplet and, ice, and contact precautions per our infectious disease doctors um, until we get the test back. Um, the next question is what, Sorry, my phone is ringing because I'm actually on call. Um, what type of home blood pressure monitoring devices? So we are kind of going at this from two angles, actually three angles. We're actually trying to work with one of our insurance carriers to see if they can provide universal home blood pressure cuffs to their patients. That process is in the, in the works. Um, we have also been trying on, a, on the antepartum side in the clinic, our nurse practitioners who are basically running our clinics right now are trying to order, um, again, through some of the insurance companies, home blood pressure cuffs. 
the rest of them we we bought um we had done some research for a research study and we bought we bought a set of them our my chair put in money for it to give to our patients um who are the inpatients we bought I mean, truthfully, we bought them on Amazon. We did re we had done research for a study and looked for sort of the most reasonable sort of mid price blood pressure cuff. Um, and I'm just getting that process started now. Um, and we're giving them to the patients as a part of the COVID pandemic um, sort of work we're doing. We're just giving them to the patients. We're te teaching them how to use the ones that we have. I don't know how great they're going to work, but we're doing we're, we're, like we literally just started on Thursday. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Jamie before we move into the case? Um, again, feel free to unmute your microphone or place questions into the chat. So Jamie, I'm not seeing anything. If anything does come in, we could um, break after your first case if you wanna move into the, the case discussion. Um. Hold on, we're I need this. Can we re share yes. the screen? Yeah. We'll do that. Give me one second. Yeah. Okay. Can you, um, talk about the, the current breastfeeding recommendations for your patients that are either PUIs or COVID positive, they're able to be managed as an outpatient? So we, part of the issue is dependent upon when the patient is diagnosed, when her symptoms resolve, because the, it's, it's been so interesting when this all first started, if you had a COVID test positive, you were, had a COVID test pending, you went to quarantine for like 14 days, or you were positive, you went to quarantine for 14 days. There are different, as I understand it, from, I, from reading the literature and reading the ID recommendations, there are, I think on the CDC too, there are two different kind of resolution strategies. One is the patient tests positive, and then they go into quarantine or social isol isolation for a specific amount of time. And it's, it's like three days after their symptoms resolve, seven days from the, when the symptoms have um, started. And then the other testing strategy is they're positive, their symptoms resolve, and then they have to have another test and it needs to be negative. And, every, and so each institution, I think, is using a different version of it. Um, and so it a little bit, so when the patient's released from their quarantine, I will say in my experience, our couple of different patients has been different each time. And I'm not an infectious disease expert. And so I would most, I always cede to whatever they tell me for that specific patient, that's what we follow. But when we send them home breastfeeding, if they are positive, then we are encouraging them to follow the CDC guideline for neonatal and maternal separation until the patient is deemed cleared to interact with her baby. And so breast pumping, or again, if they absolutely have to feed, if they want to free, feed at the breast, wearing a mask with hand hygiene until they're allowed to be together again. That I don't think, we have not had a, a lot of patients who were discharged home breastfeeding because we just don't have a lot of COVID positive patients yet. I think that that is not necessarily always going to be followed by every patient. Um, and it's also dependent on if, who they have to help them take care of their newborn. So we tell them the CDC recommendations, we tell them the timing based on what infectious disease tells us based on that specific patient. And then we try to support them and help them with our social work to, in terms of how to take care of that baby when they go home. Does that answer the question? I know I'm not trying to be deliberately vague. It just seems to change with each patient. That's okay. Yeah, I keep seeing it does kind of change back and forth. And I didn't know if the CDC currently recommended, yeah, pumping until they were asymptomatic. Because um, I've seen some previous literature about it's not transmitted in breast milk. So I just thank you so much for, I know it's changing, ever changing. I was trying to see what the most up-to-date yeah. was. 
it's not in the breast milk. It's not about the milk itself. It's about the being close to the mom. So I, so that, I think that's what fundamentally it, it, it's all about. It's about the potential risk of the mom's respiratory droplets getting to the baby because some of the newborn, there have been some, you know, cases of newborn transmission that were not thought to be vertical transmission. In fact, it was like the caregiver. I think there, there's one set of, there's one case in China where it was actually the caregiver, not the mom, but the caregiver who had COVID that gave it to the newborn. So I think it's, it's all about that. The breast milk itself, they think is safe. It's just the being near the person who has COVID. Okay, thank you. There's a question on, in the chat reco regarding recordings. We'll provide that information via the chat. So feel free to go into your case discussion. Okay, so I have two cases. I just want, I think that they're very different and I thought it was interesting. These are real cases we had here. Okay, so first patient was a 23 year old, or is, she is, she's fine. Um, a 23 year old G2P0010, she was 29 and one. She had a completely uncomplicated pregnancy to date. She had no past medical history or past surgical history. She came to the emergency room with pleuritic chest pain that was radiating to her right arm for seven hours. So at 10 p.m. the night before, she started having arm pain. And then she started noticing that it hurt to breathe. And so she came to the hospital. Um, and she presented to the emergency room. Her initial findings were that she was afebrile. She was mildly tachycardic. She had a normal respiratory rate, a normal blood pressure, and she was satting 100% on room air. The concern, because common things being common, she's a 29 week pregnant lady, was that she maybe had a PE. She had chest pain and um, tachycardia. So it seemed very reasonable. And actually, this was all done in the ED before they called us. This all started there. Her chest x-ray was normal, but they got ID involved because um, the patient was complaining because it, they just want, they were not 100% sure exactly what was going on, but they did the CT of her chest and there was no pulmonary embolus. But they saw, and this is just, I don't look at chest CTs all that often, but even I know that like, that's not normal. There's this ball down here in the bottom right hand corner. And so they had to start, they started using some of the catchphrases for COVID CT scans, which involves things like peripheral ground glass opacity. Um, so they thought maybe this was a fungal pneumonia or a round pneumonia. But the differential diagnosis, when they threw the words viral pneumonia in there, they called ID. ID was consulted and they said, yes, most likely this is fungal or bacterial, order all these things, but this COVID, the, there's a COVID pandemic, we should order the COVID-19 test. Um, and so then they put her in a negative pressure room in isolation in the emergency room while we awaited for COVID testing. And this was at the time frame where we did not have in-house testing. It had to go to the DOH. Um, so uh, it was not a two hour turnaround. So she was admitted to our sort of intermediate floor level COVID unit. Oops, oops, sorry. Um, she was placed on continuous telemetry because that's their status. That's what they do down there. She was fine. Um, and they did a fake consult at us. <laughs> she had a respiratory virus panel that was positive for rhinovirus and enterovirus. And in the very beginning of the pandemic, they were very much sure that you could not have COVID and another virus. So although she had a COVID test pending, the, suggest the suspicion that this woman had COVID was in very, very low. They still treated her the same way. We still stayed with negative pressure. Every time we saw her, we wore full PPE, but we were very much reassured that probably this was just some sort of bacterial pneumonia on top of one of her, these virus, viruses. Just interestingly, again, she had a weight count of 11.9, so not elevated. She had normal platelets. Her liver function tests were normal. There's been some literature that suggests that patients with COVID have uh, lymphopenia, thrombocytopenia, and elevated transaminases. This patient had none of that. She always had a sinus tachycardia her entire hospitalization. Sometimes it was worse, sometimes it was better. We, as the obstetricians, she had no obstetrical complaints. We did a non-stress test, the baby looked fine. 
So I basically visited her every day. We did a non-stress test. I asked her about OB things and she stayed in the COVID unit for a while. They did empirically start her on ceftriaxone and azithromycin because they were saying this was a presumed community acquired pneumonia. She had um, initially a positive blood culture, but it was probably a contaminant. Her repeat was negative. And then on hospital day three, her COVID test came back positive and everyone was shocked. Um, she never had an oxygen requirement. She never had a fever. She never had a cough. Again, she had this minor, mild sinus tachycardia. It went as high as 135. She, it responded to fluid boluses. I did a, we did a reactive non-stress test on her every day. And she went home on day five on self-isolation. And this patient was the one that was sent home for a total of seven days from her symptoms, which was the pleuritic chest pain. So she was sent home completely asymptomatic. Um, she was followed by our COVID outpatient team. They have a COVID like phone call team that calls them, uh, calls the patient. She also saw her PCP. She looked fine. She had an OB visit 10 days after discharge. She had no issues. We did a growth scan on the baby because she hadn't had one for a while and we wanted to make sure there was nothing else we were missing, but she's fine. She did great and didn't, and again, had no symptoms, none of the classic symptoms. So she would have fit into that like 86% group of very mild and no known issues with the baby. And she's so early that by the time she delivers, we are unlikely to be concerned about her giving us all COVID or having a complication, but she'll be followed. Um, that's, that patient does, oh, hold on, there's a question. So, Bill, the reason everybody was shocked by it was because at the time, we were being, like, the, the infectious disease doctors and the medicine doctors just sh didn't think she had it. She didn't have the classic presentation with the fever and the cough, and again, for a while, they were, there was a, there was an algorithm that if your RVP, so your respiratory virus panel was negative or positive, then they did not do the COVID test. They only did the COVID test if your RVP was negative. So because they were presuming that if you already had one virus, you didn't have COVID. So I think that's what it was all about. And it was, this was very, very early in, like in the whole process. So I, I mean, me saying shock, but we were just, we were very, the ID people were surprised. So I hope that answers your question. Um, it's just that she didn't look like somebody who had COVID is what everyone decided. Now we think everybody has it. So <laughs> we've definitely changed, I think, our way. Does anybody else have any other questions about that one? My other case is this one was super interesting too. So this is a 24 year old. She was a G2P1001. She was 40 weeks. She had had a prior full-term vaginal delivery. She had a hemorrhage that required um, medications and she was GBS positive. But other than that, she was totally healthy, no major issues. She had a history, her, her, she had a history of exposure to a coworker who tested positive. And she had about a week before she got tested, maybe some symptoms. And then when she did get tested, she had some mild shortness of breath, but it wasn't anything that was any different than you would think for a patient who was potentially 40 weeks pregnant. It wasn't a concerning thing. She had a, so, but she was tested because she was known to be exposed to, the, to someone who was positive. And her test came back positive on the day that she was 40 weeks. And when they called her to tell her that her test was positive, she was contracting. Uh, she had no other labor symptoms. So she was 40 weeks, she was contracting, and she was COVID positive. We also knew that the father of the baby had a test that was pending because his symptoms were that he couldn't smell or taste anything for two weeks. So the timing of all of this was a little bit um, not sure. Her symptoms were pretty vague, but she was definitely a positive. So this um, presented a bit of a logistical um, concern about how we were going to care for this patient who was maybe laboring and was definitely positive, um, although she was well otherwise. So in an abundance of caution, 
we brought this patient directly to our COVID unit for delivery and coordination of care. Um, there are some emerging, again, remembering that this is all case series and case reports, that if you have a patient who is, I mean, she was 40 weeks, it wasn't, she was quite pregnant, um, that you, and they're mild and positive, consideration of delivering them might be a good idea because if they do get sick, they tend to get sick at the end of the first week. And maybe if you get the baby out first, they won't be sick when you're delivering them. Um, this, we took this, there was a lot of thought into whether delivering this patient was the right thing to do, but ultimately we decided that if we could control this situation and keep her and her baby safe and keep people safe and avoid an emergency, that was sort of the thought process. So we admitted her, we induced her. She was completely asymptomatic. She had normal vital signs. Her blood pressures were fine. Her O2 sats were fine. Her baby looked great. She did not have any specific, the only abnormalities on her um, blood work was that she had an elevated sed rate and an elevated um, C-reactive protein. Um, we induced her with oxytocin. Um, she got an epidural. There's a lot of, again, thinking about how to coordinate this and avoid emergencies in a pandemic is really how we approach this whole case was at, to control everything. So if we could get an, an early epidural so that her pain was controlled and then if she did need an emergency C-section, we would have regional anesthesia, um, making sure that we understood exactly where we had to go if she did need a C-section um, and how we would care for her. Ultimately, this patient had uncomplicated vaginal delivery. The delivery physician who was part of our COVID inpatient team was dedicated to this patient alone. So she, was, she only took care of this patient during this hospitalization. So to reduce the cross coverage, we had a backup, take care of the rest of the unit. Our main OR was on standby for emergency C-section. Her baby was a normal sized kiddo. He had, I think it was a he, not APGARS of nine and nine. Our policy right now is that these babies get admitted to isolation as a quote unquote PUI and they went to the children's hospital. Patient herself did great. She had a lactation consult. She did, she was pumping. She was discharged postpartum day one, which was 34 hours after delivery, completely stable. And that baby went home with her mother-in-law as the caregiver. So the mom breastfed or made breast pumped and the mother-in-law fed the baby milk. This patient was also followed by our COVID tracking team. She did develop a cough, um, but she never had a fever and um, they were taking precautions with the baby. They did keep the baby separated from the mom. And in this case, they had them do isolation for a total of 14 days, um, but they're both doing fine, which I think is great. And it was a very different, a very different scenario than the first one who we discharged home pregnant, I think. So kind of in summary, the case summaries that we've had so far, mild symptoms for both of our patients. They're, the delivery patient required an extraordinary effort for coordination and planning. Um, it brought up a lot of questions about really what we would do if the patient did need an emergency C-section. We learned a lot of things about that we need to keep our medicines and our equipment outside of the room and only bring in what you need because anything that was, we, we just brought everything we thought we could ever want or need into the room, but then all that stuff was infected. <laughs> so we, in terms of, you know, re, you know reserving resources, we, we made a new plan and now we have runners and like a nurse, a nurse in the room and has a nurse outside of the room to hand her things. So just a lot of coordination. And then how do we discharge these patients and make sure they're followed up appropriately? And then the whole isolation quarantine thing is still a bit of a mystery to me because it does seem to change depending on the patient. Um, but we took those lessons and made um, some significant changes to our protocols to try to keep these patients and these moms safe. I think. Jamie, um, could I ask a question for you? Mm -hmm. um, this is when we're seeing these patients uh, getting delivered. These are patients that probably actively have COVID. What about um, patients that have had COVID and now have antibodies? Uh, do we assume then that they are no longer active and they could 
deliver with no issues, breastfeed with no issues. Um, it, it, how do you approach that? Someone that had COVID maybe at 20 weeks and then um, delivers at, at 40 weeks, do you allow them to breastfeed with no issues like a normal pregnancy? So full disclosure, we haven't had that yet. I don't think we're right, not far right. enough in, <laughs> but right, we'll right, 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 that right. 29 weeks. Right. So as I understand it, once they've had it and they're completely recovered, we go back to normal precautions. I haven't, we haven't been told by our ID folks that we have to do anything else special for those patients once they are through recovery. Now we're still, even for our patients that are negative, we've ramped up a little bit of our, um, like our PPE on L and D. Um, we, we're wearing those big shields, those mask face shields with our surgical masks, not N95s, but so we're, we still for every patient are, have increased the level of healthcare protection, but we're not, as far as I understand it, once they're recovered, they're recovered. Um, but we haven't, I think we, it, when, when these patients come, we will still consult our ID friends and make sure that there's not something else. Um, the antibody testing is not re readily available. So, um, like right, I, right. so I think that we probably need to make sure there's not something else. I don't, my guess is we'll probably rescreen them, like retest them upon admission. Um, because okay. their, their COVID swab should be negative and then we would treat them like anyone else. Okay. Okay. But we haven't had one yet. <laughs> Right. I, I think it's it's interesting because I don't think we've we've really established and I don't know if anybody else in the group has a, has any comments on where where are we establish re, establishing recovery uh, periods? Are we saying this is typically three weeks or um, I, I know with the lack of antibody testing, it's hard to say. Um, but when do we say people have really recovered uh, to the point where we could say, and it's important in these, in these cases, like when do you say it's okay to breastfeed or things like that? I don't know if someone else in the group would, would be able to answer that. So Maria, I do need to jump in because I think we have, okay. Jane, have We're Jane done. 30 more seconds before she's back. Oh, I'm not, sorry. But please, that was, okay. I mean, you're raising great points and, um, I would really encourage that if people do have comments or questions on that, um, you know, either follow up with us on email, put them in the chat now. I'll leave that open a little bit and um, maybe we can have that as a, a topic in the future or, you know, when, when that time does come around. So Jamie, do you have any last Thank minute you. comments before I, I wrap up with announcements? No, and my pager has gone off and my phone is wrong and my text message has gone off and I'm on another call. I'm really sorry guys, but no. I put my email in, um, okay. into the thing and I'm happy to answer any questions by email. Like I'm living, I, I have told my residents this, this is my first pandemic. I've never had one before. I'm running labor and delivery and every day I write a new policy and then I have to change it. So, and I'm about to go change another policy on this phone call. So I'm learning as I go, but I'm happy to share our experience because you know, I'm probably gonna have to write a book about it afterwards to get, so I can like work through my feelings and stuff. But I'm happy to answer anything and to provide you guys with any sort of information that we have. We're doing, we, we just have to keep flexing with the changes that are coming. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll just wrap up real quickly. Um, just a reminder for those who are on that you are able to collect CMEs, just complete the survey that comes out after the session and remember, one survey for each session that you attend, and you can continue to use that same link. Um, as we mentioned in the chat, chat, all materials from today will be shared, and um, please consider submitting a case discussion item for future topics. Um, and finally, we hope you'll join us for our next scheduled ECHO session on Thursday, April 16th at 8 a.m. Dr. Christina Newport will discuss palliative care for COVID-19. And if you have a, a case, a patient case or question on that topic, again, please feel free to submit it. Um, with that, thank you for your time and um, please stay safe. We'll see you soon.